Hello, my name is Stathis Gould. I am a director at IFAC, where I lead our member engagement and professional accountants in business thought leadership. And I'm David Madden. At IFAC, I lead the development of our policy and advocacy on sustainability. Climate disclosure is center stage in the ongoing efforts of the International Sustainability Standards Board, or the ISSB, in the European Union as part of the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, in proposals by the Securities Exchange Commission in the US, as well as other jurisdiction-specific initiatives. After consulting with a wide range of stakeholders earlier this year, IFAC decided to leverage the research it has already done with respect to benchmarking, reporting, and assurance of sustainability information, and to take a closer, more targeted look at corporate disclosures, addressing emissions reduction targets and plans for achieving these targets. We wanted to focus on corporate disclosures, not information submitted in questionnaires or to data aggregators. We did a global study of 600 large companies in 15 jurisdictions, specifically the G7 plus eight other countries. We wanted to capture details about what companies say about their targets and plans in their fiscal 2020 reporting in order to start a conversation about the consistency, comparability, and decision usefulness of this information. We found this disclosure by searching in sustainability reports, annual reports, integrated reports, on company websites, as well as reviewing any company-specific TCFD web pages or other type of climate report. We published our research in November, concurrent with COP27. We have a lot of information to share, as well as some insights into what this all means for CFOs and finance teams. To start, David will present some of our key findings, and then I will highlight some of the current developments, including standard setting, regulator and investor activities, and other helpful guidance for professional accountants working within businesses. Finally, I will present IFAC's thought leadership on championing an integrated mindset. David, over to you. Let's start with a headline statistic. 397 of the 600 companies we reviewed, or 66%, disclosed a numeric emissions reduction target. Note that the state of play research we conducted on sustainability reporting and assurance trends, which we did over the last two years in partnership with AICPA SEMA, shows that 92% of companies report greenhouse gas data. So emissions targets are a less frequent disclosure topic. It's also important to note that all the data we present today is likely as good as it gets because the sample set is 50% from the G7 and includes the largest 40 companies by market cap who are more likely to have the resources and market incentives for this type of disclosure. The TCFD framework for climate is a cornerstone of the ISSB's standard setting and also has broadening acceptance across many jurisdictions. So we thought that the use of TCFD would be relevant to emissions target reporting. In fact, we found that 322 companies used TCFD for their climate reporting, and 86% of these companies also had emissions targets. In contrast, 44% of companies who did not use TCFD for their climate reporting disclosed targets. This data suggests to us that TCFD may be part of the pathway to better climate-related disclosure, including targets and plans. When we examined the terminology that companies use to explain the reductions targets, we found a good degree of variability. In fact, we concluded that we needed five separate categories to capture the types of emissions targets that we found in company disclosures. A key feature of emissions targets is whether or not they include scope three emissions or supply chain related emissions. We found that only 39% of targets included scope three. This chart details our five categories. First, reading from the bottom up, is greenhouse gas neutral in the value chain? These are targets for becoming carbon neutral, so zero or near zero carbon, or net zero, so zero emissions of all greenhouse gases, and inclusive of scope three emissions, both with a terminal date target 
as well as one or more interim targets. Next is greenhouse gas neutral in value chain without any interim targets. The blue shading in the chart indicates that 25% of targets fit in these two categories. Now moving to greenhouse gas neutral targets that focus only on the operations of the company. So scope one and scope two emissions, but excluding scope three, either with or without interim targets. 40% of targets are included here in the green portions of the bar chart. And finally, 35% of the targets we found are categorized as others. According to our methodology, of the 397 targets we found, 65% reach carbon neutrality or net zero emissions. These blue and green targets will be the focus going forward. When we look at the distribution of targets across jurisdictions, we notice a difference between the most economically developed G7 nations versus the other eight jurisdictions. 59% of the companies we examined from the G7 disclosed greenhouse gas neutral targets, be they inclusive or exclusive of the scope three or interim targets. Again, these are the blue and green companies. This compares to 30% of companies from the other eight jurisdictions. We infer that societal or other market pressures, not regulation, seem to be driving disclosure at a reasonably high level across the G7. Next, let's focus on the dates or deadlines that companies set for achieving their emissions reductions targets. Here again, we focus on greenhouse gas neutral targets, be they inclusive of scope three or not, and with or without interim targets. 129 companies had a 2050 date, which is consistent with the Paris Agreement. The current ISSB climate exposure draft requires that any milestones or targets be disclosed if the company has one. So it's not a requirement that a company have a target. In the US, the SEC's proposals also take a voluntary approach on targets. In contrast, the European sustainability reporting standards say that a company needs to have a 2030 target with a zero target no later than 2050. For those companies who have set a more aggressive target date, something before 2050, we observe that they are more prevalent in finance or light industry sectors, and over half of these targets exclude scope three. Next, let's examine the prevalence of intensity targets versus absolute targets. Absolute targets require a company to reduce overall emissions relative to, in percentage terms, a base year. Intensity targets give information about an entity's emissions reductions relative to its economic activity. Less than 5% of the 397 companies we found with targets included both types. The distinction is important because the ISSB's exposure draft for climate currently requires companies to report their backward-looking historic emissions on both an absolute and intensity basis. So we have a potential misalignment between what companies will be reporting on their historic emissions versus how they explain their future emissions reduction targets. Finally, 243, 61% of the targets we looked at were nonspecific or included carbon offsets. We believe that these are as prevalent as they are because it's difficult to get to zero. So targets can be more ambiguous than absolute, and they often need to include carbon offset strategies in order to reach zero or near zero emissions. Now, switching to the transition plans that companies provide for reaching their emissions reduction targets. Most companies, 90% who have a target, also disclose a plan. However, these plans vary widely in detail, scope, and ability to assess progress. We found it challenging to normalize the plans we reviewed. And given that the objective of the study was not to score company disclosures, we decided that the best way to illustrate the variability in transition plans was to include some specific examples in our report, which you can find on IFAC's Sustainability Standards webpage. But we could tabulate different types of actions that companies specify. For example, reduction strategies, especially renewable energy sources and energy efficiencies, these far outnumbered the planned use of carbon offsets. But earlier, we observed that the majority of targets, 61%, were ambiguous and included carbon offsets. 
yet only 23% of transition plans specify offsets. So is there a disconnect between what companies say about targets versus what they specify in their transition plans? One more point about targets and plans. Verification. 70% of targets we found were Paris aligned, meaning net zero by no later than 2050. This means 30% of targets do not comply, contributing to less comparability. Of the 70% that are Paris aligned, 61% of these were subjected to external evaluation by the Science-Based Targets Initiative, or SBTI, which is an organization that verifies that emissions targets plus a plan for achieving them are in line with the Paris Agreement. Note the dark blue shading in the graph. This is a unique situation in corporate reporting. The existence of a third-party service provider that is opining not only on the reliability of a specific number or KPI, but on the validity of a corporate strategic objective. This differs from the use of consultants to verify greenhouse gas numbers or other ESG KPIs, which we know is common practice today in sustainability assurance. Finally, much of the discussion between investors and the profession focuses on the financial impact of what companies say they're going to do to reduce their emissions versus what they disclose in terms of the cost of this transition. In a study of this scope, we did not research the financial statements of 600 companies, but we did capture what companies said about the cost of transition. Of those who disclose a target and a plan, a total of 84, or 24%, also provided their past or estimated future spend to implement plan actions. Only 14 companies provided both past and future expenditures. In terms of financial impact, our analysis leaves us wondering how decision useful all this information really is. This is an important question for companies who currently provide or are considering providing emissions target and transition plan information to investors and other stakeholders. Stathis will turn our attention to what we think our study means for companies and the next steps for those looking to enhance their climate-related disclosures. While it is important for companies to make long-term commitments to reduce admissions to net zero, companies also need to create and implement transition plans to put them on a credible path to achieving their climate goals and emission reduction targets. Our research shows that many companies have established net zero or climate neutrality commitments. However, the nature of these targets and their scope in terms of emissions covered and timeframes vary widely. And in terms of transition plans, although most companies with an emissions target provide information at some level of detail on how they plan to achieve their targets, The nature of transition plan reporting is disparate in terms of detail and location of disclosures. This makes it difficult for stakeholders to know if current and proposed actions are credible or to compare transition plans across companies. Consequently, transition plans are getting much attention in the climate reporting arena. Such plans set out the goals and actions companies are or intend to take to meet their net zero commitments. They should be an integral part of their overall corporate strategy. Some financial sector institutions and investment organisations, particularly those signed up to initiatives such as the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, or GFANS for short, have committed to reduce financed emissions in their portfolios in order to meet their own net zero commitments to achieve the International Paris Agreement, which is based on a 2 degrees Celsius or lower and ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius global temperature rise scenario. On November 1st, 2022, GFANS launched their final recommendations and guidance on financial institution net zero transition plans. These recommendations describe how financial institutions can operationalize their net zero commitments and support the real economy transition. As standard setters and regulators focus on enabling more standardized and enhanced climate-related and transition plan disclosure for investors and stakeholders, there are two main challenges that they are seeking to address, as highlighted by IFAC's research. First, 
the variation in disclosure on emissions reduction targets and transition plans in annual sustainability or TCFD related reports. Second, a consensus view on what good decision useful climate related disclosure comprises. From a corporate and financial planning perspective, CFOs and finance teams are increasingly playing a pivotal role in providing boards and management with information needed to guide short-term and longer-term actions by companies to deliver on their commitments and to support the preparation of decision-useful climate-related disclosure for investors and other stakeholders. There are various initiatives to be aware of, some of which David referenced. You might be aware of the work of the International Sustainability Standards Board under the IFRS Foundation to develop a comprehensive global baseline for private sector sustainability-related financial disclosure, called the IFRS Sustainability Disclosure Standards. As with IFRS financial reporting standards, we expect most jurisdictions to adopt these standards and build on them. They are built on the foundation of the four pillars of the FSB's TCFD recommendations. Governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. The IWSB's proposed standard S2 on climate-related disclosures is expected to be finalized in early 2023. It includes a requirement to disclose the effects of significant climate-related risks and opportunities on its strategy and decision-making, including its transition plans. Further, such disclosures should include how the company is responding to significant climate-related risks and opportunities, including how it plans to achieve any climate-related targets it has set, including changes in its strategy and resource allocation to address the risks and opportunities. Stakeholder responses to the proposed standard are positive when it comes to these transition plans disclosures. Investors in particular strongly support additional clarity on how companies intend to achieve their emissions reduction targets and progress made. Transition plan disclosure is also an element of the EU standards on sustainability reporting under the new Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive that will soon come into force. The proposed European Sustainability Reporting Standard on Climate Change includes a specific disclosure requirement addressing climate change mitigation, which requires companies to disclose its plans to ensure that its business model and strategy are compatible with the transition to a climate neutral economy and with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius in line with the Paris Agreement. Note how the IWSB is creating apolitical standards for global adoption. So it does not reference the Paris Agreement or anything that is subject to a jurisdiction specific policy. In the UK, the government's Transition Plan Task Force, TPT for short, launched its disclosure framework and implementation guidance on climate transition plans to strengthen disclosure as well as to inform and build on international disclosure standards in the context of UK's legally binding targets to cut greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050, including binding interim targets. The guidance includes key stages to preparing and disclosing a transition plan. The TPT's recommendations directly build on the existing and emerging guidance and standards on climate-related risk disclosures as provided by the TCFD and the IWSB. The TPT recommendations will be aimed at being a gold standard based on a strategic and rounded approach to transition plans that focuses on companies and investors moving beyond paper decarbonisation to achieving real world impact. Corporate actions are expected in three areas. First, to decarbonise by reducing GHG emissions. Second, to respond to physical and transition risk including seizing opportunities, and third, contributing to an economy-wide transition. There are a few other sources of guidance available that are worth noting. A coalition of NGOs, including the We Mean Business Coalition, CDP, Ceres, and EDF, 
that work with the world's largest companies and investors on climate and sustainability priorities have issued guidance on the best-in-class practices for transition plans. This includes four components of a transition plan. Number one, an emissions reduction strategy that includes current and near-term actions the company is taking. Two, integration of governance and business strategy with respect to climate, including decisions to adjust investments and business model. Three, alignment of company public policy activities, including lobbying. And finally, fourth, focusing on a just transition with activities to support workforce, suppliers and customers in the net zero transition. Another practical transition plan framework is from the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, which issued an abatement capacity assessment framework and a standardized template to help companies and their investors understand the potential for reducing emissions and the financial implications of meeting a net zero commitment. The framework incorporates three practical steps in transition planning. First, determining a company's current baseline emissions. Second, identifying actions that can cost effectively cut emissions now, such as energy efficiency, adopting technology, and greening the power supply. Third, assessing steps and strategies that can cost effectively reduce emissions in the future under different carbon price assumptions. This framework provides a starting point for the development of transition plans and determining their economic feasibility. Importantly, it helps facilitate a partnership with capital providers who might be more willing and able to take the long view and actively create an environment where solutions can take shape in businesses. I should add that Accounting for Sustainability has also issued useful guidance for finance teams on addressing the practical issues of setting credible net zero targets and embedding them into finance processes and decisions. In addition to advocating for global standards for reporting and assurance, we believe that an integrated mindset is key to CFO and finance functions contributing to climate transition planning and to the real world achievement of net zero climate commitments. Companies that have set ambitious Paris aligned climate and emissions reduction targets need to plan pathways and actions to meet these targets and decarbonize their business models. This requires finance functions enabling an integrated mindset, which is a critical success factor for sustainable transition and avoiding greenwashing. As a result, we are seeing more finance teams positioned as stewards and implementers of climate transition plans. IFAC is advocating for the CFO and finance functions role in enabling an integrated mindset and overcoming the challenges to achieving sustainable value creation presented by silo thinking and processes. Climate emissions reduction plans need to be integrated into business strategy and planning, as well as core reporting processes and subject to appropriate governance oversight. The challenge is that sustainability and financial planning and reporting are typically siloed in organizations, which does not reflect the reality of how companies need to think, measure, manage and report when making decisions about how to achieve their sustainability goals and to understand the financial implications of doing so. Finance is best positioned to break down silos to drive decisions and better reporting by building trust in sustainability information and processes with necessary controls and systems. Connecting sustainability and financial information and reporting processes and prioritizing material issues and information from various corporate functions and external sources so they are integrated into planning, financial analysis, and scorecards. The primary role of CFOs and finance teams is to enable management and boards to make informed decisions and to improve the decision usefulness of reporting. This is a sweet spot for CFOs and their finance teams. They can leverage their central position and expertise in financial processes and information to enhance the connectivity and maturity of sustainability information and ensure it is incorporated in internal decision-making and is on a par with financial information. Ultimately, the CFO and finance functions involvement in the preparation 
and delivery of transitions plans should involve creating a link to financial planning and resource allocation and aim to avoid the impairment and stranding of existing high emission assets while acquiring new low or zero emissions assets. And regulatory and societal pressures will only increase from here. As a result, finance teams are increasingly at the centre of attention to ensure climate transition planning is integrated into business strategy and planning. And that information leads to action and useful disclosure. The good news is that there is a wealth of guidance and information being issued to support finance and accounting professionals in their expanded roles. Thank you for your attention.